Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock, episode 191 if you can believe it. This week the questions are taken from Guide 240, Guide to the Cleveland Class Cruisers of the US Navy, and the Emergency Wednesday video, thanks to um, certain people, uh, with relation to the Battle of the Dover Strait in 1917. Let's get on with it, shall we? Brendan Boersdorf asks... I've seen a few classes of destroyer that carried float planes for scouting purposes. Was it an effective use of space to add a catapult to such a small ship, or were they just oddities that really weren't that effective? Uh, more the latter than anything else. They faced a few problems, one of which is kind of, as I've recalled to it, called it before, the Issei paradox of, yes, you can theoretically come up with a use for it, but if you are using it, you probably have much bigger problems than that's ever going to solve, uh, which basically comes down to, you know, yeah, you can fit a float plane to a destroyer. It can operate. As you can see here, the U.S. tried it with some Fletcher class destroyers. Um, and after some initial problems with the crane that was supposed to hoist the thing back on board, they eventually worked out that it was technically feasible. But... If you're in a position where your destroyers are launching float planes, or well, what's happened to your aircraft carriers, what's happened to your battleships, what's happened to your cruisers, you know, all these other ships that can carry significantly more scouting aircraft. Um, and on top of that, that, fundamentally, as you can tell from the profile, it involves removing a bunch of stuff, including one of the five inch guns. So what you end up with is, yes, technically a destroyer that can see a lot further, perhaps can lead its flotilla around as a scout. But on the other hand, hopefully this destroyer is also going to be used in action. And then when it's used in action, you'll find it's undergunned, generally underarmed, has less anti-aircraft defense, possibly less torpedoes to launch capital ships. And as a variety of US cruisers found at the first Battle of Savo Island, you also have put an incredibly flammable, effectively fuel air bomb up on top. And destroyers, when they end up in gunfights with other destroyers, do tend to get peppered quite a lot. At which point, yeah, you've basically put a giant shoot here to envelop destroy in gigantic fireball sign on your ship. Which, you know, great. So you've, you've effectively invented a ship that can see its own doom coming at a very long range. Which is not really that useful. And so the idea was fairly quickly dropped. I mean, the, the, the few ships that had been converted kind of hung around with some of the equipment in place because it, it's easier to just send them into action that way but without the aircraft and yeah fundamentally the only time really in all of history that destroyers and aircraft launching went together was in the latter stages of world war one when you know full-size carriers hadn't come into play and well float planes in large part hadn't come into play and you've got some very interesting destroyer lighters where you literally towed a small biplane behind you on a little barge, which could then take off. And even then, that was kind of a one-shot disposable thing. Pointy-haired Jedi, hello, uh, asks, this video, that's the one on Broke, um, has reminded me, you've mentioned in the past how ferocious World War II small ship skirmishes were in the channel. Will we get a video on that at some point? Yes, most definitely. I've been collecting a variety of different reference works with regards to Schnellbooter, uh, the German, as the British call them, E-boats, Germans call them S-boats, um, obviously the Italian Mars boats, the British MTBs and MGBs, and yeah, at some point I'll be putting together a video that covers at least part of their operations, which is usually quite exciting. Um, you might ask, well, why am I not including the USPT boats in that equation? They have a slightly different profile when it comes to how they execute their missions, mostly because there wasn't a tremendous number of Japanese direct equivalents. So USPT boats more often than not would find themselves fighting much larger vessels, which is an exciting story, but in and of itself to tell, but not one that meshes particularly well with telling the story of you know mass flotilla actions between collections of small craft, the way that, that, that things went down in the Mediterranean and especially in the Channel. Sadwings Raging asks, in this video, again this is the broke video, there what seem to be placards on some of the masts of those destroyers. They look like two pyramids, one pointing up, one pointing down, and then a square. There may even be a square on another ship, but it's just an outline, so it might be something else entirely. What are these? Squadron leadership designations or something else? <laughs> 
So this is what is stated in the Royal Navy's handbook that it issued to officers to help with recognition of German ships. So it says for destroyers, distinctive marks. The destroyers of a flotilla generally all carry a shaped frame or frames with the centre cut out, triangle, circle, diamond or half moon, on the foremast as a flotilla sign, and a second shape of varying description on the mainmast as individual sign. In some cases, the flotilla is distinguished by the absence of the foremost sign. In June 1917, the first and second flotillas were thus distinguished. Leaders of flotillas generally carry the flotilla sign only on the foremast and no individual sign. So in this shot of German torpedo boats, you can see the solid symbols up front. So as you said, you've got a, well, we've got one with nothing on the mast, one with a square, one with an upside down, upside down triangle, one with a um, triangle the right way up. These indicate that they all belong to different flotillas. And then, as you mentioned, right at the back, you can also see that one of them at least has a hollow circle. So that's its individual sign. So that indicates it's part of a flotilla, but not the leader. It does get a bit difficult to work out which main mast belongs to which destroyer. But it's entirely possible, based on that statement, that um, either 62 or... Yeah, 62, I think, is first or second flotilla. And there may well be a flotilla leader somewhere in this collection as well. Alessandro Rizzuti asks, why were some superfiring turrets much more distant from each other aft rather than forward, such as with the Congos? You see this on basically every pre-World War I and immediately start of World War I battle cruiser design from, well, the three nations that actually built battle cruisers, Japan, Germany, and the UK, where the ships have two superfiring or near enough superfiring aft turrets. You can see here there's a Congo class battle cruiser, which, along with things like Tiger, really do emphasize the spaced out nature of it. The British, early British battle cruisers like Lion, for example, have a Q turret, which is actually more amidships, but this is kind of the layout that I think the question is getting at. And the reason for this is a combination of the desire for speed and the limitations of boiler and engine technology at the time because unless there's some seriously in complex internal trunking going on, you can usually tell where a ship's boilers are from where the funnels are. So in this example, you can see the boilers are amidships between the, super, the bridge superstructure forward and the first aft turret. But the boilers don't turn the propellers. They generate the steam that drives the turbines that turn the propellers. And... The problem there is that if you have two superfiring turrets closely spaced like there are at the front, then you can have your engines behind those two turrets, sure, and then the turrets and their magazines separate the uh, boilers from the engines. There are, apart from weight distribution issues, there are two primary issues with that related to propulsion. One of which is that it means the distance from the engine to the propeller is significantly less, so it's a fairly short shaft. That does have some advantages, but one of the major disadvantages is it means that the angle of the shaft going from the centre of the turbine down to where the propeller is in the water will be a lot steeper. Uh, you might remember in a previous stride up we discussed uh, why propeller shafts are angled in the first place on most ships. And secondly, it means that the steam that's generated by the boilers then has to pass through a considerable length of the ship to reach the engines by which point it might have lost heat and therefore pressure which means you're not getting as much power to the engines which means you're not going to go as fast so you don't really want that but with the sheer size and number of boilers that you need in 1910, early 1910s era technology to get yourself up to speed, there's not a tremendous amount you can actually do to mitigate this problem. If you then introduce small tube boilers, which people start to do in the mid to late 1910s, then you can solve this problem because the amount of space that you need for a given amount of power is less and therefore you can fit all the engines and boilers into one central section of midships which is why when you say take a look at hood you'll see that hood has the forward turrets then the bridge then the funnels because that's where the boilers are then a big blank space if it well, effectively speaking in terms of armament um which is also where you'll find the main mast 
that's where the engines are. So they're all grouped together, so absolutely minimal power loss. And then you have the two aft turrets sitting at the end of the engine space. The problem with something like Congo or Tiger, um, or to a lesser extent, Deflinger, is that if... Oh, there, there is one other problem. So if you run steam, hot steam past the magazine, two aft magazines, you have great problems keeping the magazines cool enough to ensure that your ammunition is stable and similar uh, the charges are similar in power to the forward ones, but anyway. The problem is that you might think, well, surely you therefore might, you know, like with hood stick all the t both turrets right aft. And the problem is at that point you will create significant weight distribution issues because you've got two very heavy turrets, two very heavy barbettes all the way at the back of the ship. That's going to cause some serious problems for the hull. So your kind of compromise solution is this, where you have your boilers you then pass the steam past one of your turrets which is obviously the, the first one just there yes you do have to do some cooling to the magazines but to be honest by the early 1910s that's not something people are completely unfamiliar with uh, even if they doesn't necessarily always work then in the space between these two turrets is the engines uh, the turbines and then you have, finally, the, the aftmost turret, which sits above the propeller shafts. There's quite a nice cross-sectional plan of Tiger that you can look up, and you can see exactly this. And you can see the sheer size of the turbines as well, why you couldn't sit the turbines at this time period directly under the, the magazines and barbettes, because they're just far, far too large. And as I mentioned, with, with something like Hood, and when you look at the World well, the post-World War I battlecruiser designs like Amagi and Lexington and, well, G3 rearranged the turret layer completely, but Amagi and Lexington at least, then you can see that because the boiler technology and propulsion technology in general has gotten more efficient and smaller, they can fit it all amidships and you go back to a more conventional looking layout than the spaced out layout you see in high-speed battlecruisers of the early 1910s. Michael Wilson asks, in this video and a few others, you have at various points used two different pronunciations of lieutenant. Do you have any strong inclinations towards either one? It is one of the minor things I struggle with because whilst I am British, I grew up watching a lot of American sci-fi, Babylon 5, Stargate SG-1, Star Trek, etc. And of course, in all of those, the rank is pronounced lieutenant. So young Drax mind, it kind of got embedded that, you know, Ensign, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander, Commander, Captain, Star Trek rank structure. And so when I see it spelt out, my brain defaults to saying Lieutenant. Now, of course, that's not how it's pronounced in the UK. Um, in the UK for naval ranks, as far as I can tell, at least, it's either pronounced Lieutenant or Lieutenant, although some people have told me that lieutenant is more of an army pronunciation and lieutenant is more of a navy pronunciation, but I've also had other people tell me the complete opposite. Um, and I've had other people tell me that either one is used aboard ships. So I just throw my hands up in the air and just go, whatever. Uh, one of the, either way, in the Royal Navy, they don't say lieutenant. But as I said, my, my brain defaults to lieutenant because of my early childhood experiences. So... I try, where possible, to get the pronunciation correct for the Navy in question. So, if we're talking about the Kriegsmarine or the Kaiserliche Marine, it's Leutnant, at least as far as I can get, uh, with my limited German. If I'm talking about a uh, Royal Navy rank, I will try and use either Lieutenant or Lieutenant um, but I sometimes slip back by accident. And if I'm talking about an American officer, then I will use lieutenant because that's how they, he would have been known. Um, there's, I don't, I mean, it's some people, I, and I've seen in videos, people like, oh, you're pronouncing it wrong. It's it's this or the, the, that. And I've had people on both sides, you know, I've, I've been, I've called a Royal Navy officer a, a lieutenant and they're like, no, it's lieutenant. And I've seen, I've called a, an American officer, a lieutenant, and they're like, no, it's lieutenant. And it's like, no, I'm, I am varying it, or trying to at least, based 
on the Navy in question, because if, if you went on board a Royal Navy ship and you asked to see a lieutenant, everyone would be like, what? I kind of get what you're getting on, but what? Um, whereas I suspect if I went on a US Navy ship and asked to see a lieutenant or a lieutenant, I'd get similar confused looks. And, you know, you, you wouldn't expect me to, you know, turn around and call a US Navy officer a lieutenant or a German officer a lieutenant. So they're all different ways of pronouncing the same rank. I'm tr I try, emphasis on try, to get the right pronunciation for the right Navy. And that does mean, you know, things will change around depending on which video. But if I really get into into a reading out a, a, a script that I've written and I'm not keeping my eye on the ball, if I just see an abbreviation, you know, LT dot someone or LT CDR dot someone, my brain will default if I'm not thinking quickly enough to lieutenant. So I apologize if I occasionally get the pronunciation the wrong way around, um, but I don't apologize for changing my pronunciation depending on the Navy. Luke Dogwalker asks, in a surface action using optical fire control, did the Clevelands have any problems distinguishing between the shell splashes of the five and six inch guns? Did they employ any techniques to get around this problem and did radar alleviate this problem? Well, there are two important caveats to put on that. Firstly, because the Clevelands are coming into service a little bit later in the war, um, and in terms of the overall pattern of World War II, for the Americans, they're coming into service relatively soon after the start of their involvement in... Well, the first Clevelands are, in, are commissioned in the mid nine, in mid-1942, but that means they're only beginning to see action in late 42 and early 43, and that's the first view, and then it builds up. But the short version of that is that, therefore, the Clevelands don't actually see as much surface action as some of the other US cruiser classes. So we have a little bit less to go on as compared to, you know, US cruiser classes that were around right from the very beginning, because an awful lot of the cruiser v cruiser or cruiser v destroyer major anti-surface actions took place in the first year or so of the war. So they mostly involved the older Brooklyn, New Orleans, etc. class cruisers. That's not to say they didn't take part. Um, Empress Augusta Bay, the Battle of Empress Augusta Bay, for example, has both Cleveland and Columbia, amongst others, present. But overall, there's, there's a slightly smaller data set to draw on when it comes to, you know, did the Clevelands have issues with both of their gun batteries operating. The second one to bear in mind is that the six inch guns have a far, far greater range than the five inch 38s. Um, yes, they're only separated by a caliber in one inch, but the five inch are 38 caliber guns. Um, they're good dual purpose weapons, but they are, as I've said before, slightly more spec towards the AA role than the anti-surface role. And so in a typical cruiser action, engaging at typical cruiser ranges, the 5-inch 38s are either going to be out of range or at the very, very limits of their range, which means you're not going to have too many issues because you don't really usually engage with your 5-inch secondaries at absolute maximum range unless you have no other choice. So a lot of the time, the 6-inch guns are going to be the only things that come into play. Now... With that aside, there is one other very important thing to bear in mind, which is that because the Clevelands are coming into service in late 42 and early 43, there is no point at which a Cleveland is being sent out utilising only optical fire control systems. Every Cleveland-class vessel that hits the water and then is sent out into action has radar already in some way, shape or form. Obviously, it gets better as the war progresses. So... Um, a situation where Cleveland is firing only under optical fire control would be a situation where Cleveland has already been hit hard enough that all of the radar and the, the control section, the CIC, etc., has all been knocked out, at which point you probably have bigger problems than which shell splashes which. So I don't think the Clevelands had any particular problems distinguishing the, the shell splashes of five and six inch guns but at the same time I think that's largely because there weren't that many scenarios where they had to use 
both as a combined battery against a surface target. Now, when it comes to the rare occasion where this might be necessary, would radar alleviate this problem? Later radars, yes, because uh, later radars obviously will give you an can spot the shell splashes and obviously at the, the exact time so if you know the range which radar will give you very accurately you know the characteristics of your guns you know let's say that your six inch guns have fired a salvo you know in for example 15 seconds that salvo is going to land if your five inch guns are merrily plinking away at their maximum rate of fire if you're seeing splashes appear at six seconds nine seconds and 12 seconds then you're pretty sure that those are going to be your five inch shell splashes whereas if you then see a slightly larger contact appear once at 15 seconds okay that's going to be your six inch shell splash salvo so there, there are there are ways of dealing with that with radar and i mean to be honest even even if you are relying on purely optical for whatever reason the difference in the rate of fire and flight time of the two types of shell would be enough to give a half decent spot to some idea that of you know which shells are which especially at the closer ranges because obviously as i said with the range limitations on five inch 38 if you are engaging with those you are going to be comfortably in range of a optical spotter being able to go oh yes well lots of slightly small splashes that'll be the five inch battery then Tovey Churchill asks, in terms of convoy duty and conventional naval engagement, which class of cruisers do you think is more suitable, Leander or Exeter? I mean, overall, the Royal Navy kind of voted with its budget when you look at how many Leanders they produce compared to how many uh, York class. Albeit, I mean, yes, there are treaty limitations and such, but once the treaty limits came off, they weren't exactly rushing to go back to the small heavy cruiser that the York and Exeter represented. But nonetheless, if you're going to look at it in completely objective terms, I think with convoy duty, it depends on the threat. With conventional naval engagement, I think it depends on the time. So if your main worry in a convoy is enemy cruiser raiding, like say an Admiral Hipper showing up or something like that, then sure, you probably want an Exeter for the greater hitting power and longer range of its 8-inch guns. But for more general convoy work, a Leander is probably an overall better choice, not the least of which because there's more of them. Whereas if you're looking at a fleet engagement, conventional naval fight, then early on in the war, where you're still looking at mostly optical fire control systems, maybe with some surface search radar involved, you're probably somewhat better off with an Exeter class because it hits harder it has slightly better protection etc whereas by the time you get to the latter part of the war then once you now have radar fire control in play a lot more you can guarantee to hit a lot better at, at longer ranges then the leander's probably a slightly better choice because just rate of fire um, and the the radar mostly overcoming the issues with whether or not your six inch guns can hit hard enough and often enough before heavier guns hit back at you obviously with the caveat of if you're taking on roughly similar opponents the larger and larger your opponent gets like you know a treaty breaking ten thousand ton heavy cruiser well if if you're in a seven to eight thousand ton sub treaty cruiser you're not in a good place anyway but in th those particular cases you might as well go with the exeter or the york class because whatever hits you manage to get in before you get smashed are probably going to do more damage but if in in an equal partner engagement i.e a 10,000 ton or less cruiser which you know might be slightly more powerful than you but not as powerful or if you're going up against a navigatory well that's a destroyer but a condottieri one of the larger condottieri cruisers or going up against you know destroyers and so forth i'd probably want a leander on my side for those so yeah heavier targets york exeter lighter targets leander and trending towards favoring the leander as time goes on and radar fire control becomes more and more of a thing of course by that point neither of the yorks were around so <laughs> didn't make much odds that way either ctx lpr asks 
the Dr Cleveland and Littorio classes all had exposed barbettes that could have been integrated into superstructure decks close by. Was this a weight-saving measure? It makes them look slightly unfinished with the naked barbettes just poking out of the deck. It does have to do with weight, but it's more just practical ship design. When you consider the barbettes of a ship, whether it be a cruiser or a battleship, these are, for understandable reasons, fairly heavily armoured especially the battleship ones. Now, yes, you could integrate some superstructure around them, but that's going to lead to a number of issues. One, it's unnecessary weight high up in the ship, which could cause stability issues. Yes, superstructure doesn't weigh as much as armor, but still, it, you're still talking, you know, probably tens of tons, if not more. Two, it means that if the turret rotates close to the superstructure, it's more likely that bit of superstructure is going to be affected by the blast effects of the guns anyway, which you know is not really going to be helping, helping things all that much. If you don't need the space, the extra superstructure space, then you don't need the extra weight just for aesthetic purposes. Also, if the barbette is going to be hit, superstructure by its by necessity, is generally fairly lightweight. It's not going to do anything particularly to stop an sh incoming shell, or in most cases even initiate a shell's fuse. So all it's doing at that point is creating, if your barbette is hit and the shell explodes hopefully on the barbette rather than having penetrated inside it, superstructure wrapping around part of it is just going to create more shrapnel. And it's also going to make any repairs harder to do because you're going to have to cut away a ton of twisted wreckage before you get to the barbette. And the barbette is not improved by having the superstructure near it. So at that point, if the barbette comes up in a certain place and your calculations show that, well, your superstructure ends 10, 15, 20 feet forward and there's no particular need to extend it aft, well, then don't extend it aft. Um, yes, it can lead to some slightly odd appearances, but it's more a case of function over form, which usually is a, a major, fairly major thing when it comes to capital ship design and warship design generally. Now, I suppose you could make the argument that, especially in a cruiser like a Cleveland, that maybe integrating it into the superstructure or integrating the superstructure around the barbette would give it some slightly better protection against high explosive shells because superstructure might well set those off. But one, if your barbette's being penetrated by high explosive shells, you're designing your barbette wrong. And two, a cruiser is far less able to cope with otherwise relatively unnecessary superstructure extensions, both in terms of weight and stability, because they are smaller. A similar or possibly slightly larger superstructure extension on a battleship is a weight variance that a battleship is much more capable of handling. But at that point, when you're talking about, you know, a barbette that is in the double digits of inches thick, there is literally no benefit to coating the barbette in superstructure at that point, as I mentioned. In fact, it, the other thing is it could actually be worse on another count, which is that hits nearby to the barbette, if the barbette is exposed, will not do a tremendous amount. Whereas if you've wrapped the superstructure around, say, half of the barbette, then a hit to that might dislodge shrapnel, which used to be superstructure, and that might then jam the turret because the turret obviously rotates on a ring sitting on the barbette, so you might actually end up jamming your or obstructing the turret with twisted wreckage because the superstructure is right there, which would obviously be a bad thing. Mo Alzaben asks, I have a question on behalf of one of my friends. His granddad served in the US Navy in the Pacific War. He was the commander of a PT boat named RON-32, which had a mosquito badge. He probably served around the Solomons, as far as he's told us. I'm asking, how do we find out about his past? Because my friend doesn't know about his granddad's past as he never told him. So how can we find any records? So I'm fairly well versed in how to pull off this kind of thing in the UK. I'm not so sure about the US. If anyone in the US has a better idea about how to go about accessing service records for World War II era, era veterans, then please, you know, 
feel free to put in the comments below. So hopefully, um, some, there'll be the questioner will be able to read that and learn a bit more. But as far as I'm aware, most World War II era service records, assuming that the person in question didn't go on to serve in the U.S. Armed Forces until like the 1960s or something, should be available from the National Personnel Records Center which you can find online via the U.S. National Archives. That's archives.gov. Um, and then they do charge a copying fee, but if you can provide name, ideally service number, ship they served on rough time periods of service, etc., and get in contact with them, they should be able to then provide you with a copy of the service records which will give you a lot more indication and an idea of what they actually what that person actually did during the war where they were what they served on etc etc but as i say you know if other people have more detail then please chime in below jh3 ll skull asks was there anything in the naval treaties that prevented a navy from leaving elements off of a design in order to save weight whilst the treaty was active that could relatively easily be fitted once either the escalator clause was triggered or the treaties were abandoned. For example, could a ship leave all of its anti-aircraft armament neatly in a warehouse somewhere? Technically, it was against the rules because standard displacement was defined in such a way that it was supposed to include all of the ship's armament. And some things are slightly more obvious than others if you leave them out completely, like, say, all AA armor. You leave that out and say, no, 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 look, my cruiser is 10,000 tons standard. People can look at you and go, yeah, but it's not going to be once you put some anti-aircraft guns on it, is it? And you, you kind of do need them, so stop pulling the wool over our eyes. And likewise, you know, if you build a ship with, say, four twin turrets, or you design a ship with four twin turrets, but you only include three twin turrets, you leave off the other one, or the barbette, or the area where the barbette's going to go is a bit of a giveaway. Because ship designers across the world, you know, there there are certain limits to what ship design can do. And this was one of the ways that each, each nation kind of kept a check on the others. Because they'd take a look at the published specs, the any visual records they got of intelligence. And they'd retro-calculate and go, mm, yeah, ballpark, this is on the money. Or, no, this, this is blatant lies. <laughs> and so... I suppose, yeah, you're not going to get away with hiding or not including significant chunks of the main armament. You might get away with either not installing or installing smaller numbers of torpedoes, um, although the amount of weight you're going to save is going to be relatively minimal. So, for example, you could include the sweep space and mounting strength for, say, quadruple torpedo launchers but only include twin torpedo launchers, only install twins, which so that saves you the weight of however many banks of torpedo launchers you've got. So let's say you're like the Japanese, you install four sets of torpedo launchers. If you install four twins, well, that saved you eight torpedoes and their launchers worth of weight, assuming you're not carrying any reloads. It's a small amount it, but it's something if you're repeating this kind of thing all over the place in lots of different areas. So again, for example, you might plan your ship to have lots of anti-aircraft weaponry. So yeah, you might say, okay, I'm going to have, I don't know, let's say six twin four-inch AA or five-inch whatever flavor you want. And I also want to have, I don't know, a dozen medium and light AA guns. But you might only install four twins and maybe stick a couple of maybe twin 40 mil or 37 mil or whatever flavor you would like in the place where you intended to put the two remaining twin heavy AA mounts. So something's there. People are, oh, yeah, they designed a mount and there's something there. But then come wartime or the lapse of the treaties, you can quickly swap in and now you have six twin heavy AA or something like that. Again, small amount of weight saving, but potentially adds up all the way across the board. But it is a very complex thing to do. It's quite difficult to pull off, and you do have to integrate it into pretty much all levels of the design of your ship in order to get away with it. And even then, you're going to have incremental improvements. So people are going to look at your ship 
in its, let's say, its disguised form. And they're going to know, OK, it's got a decent anti-aircraft arm, it's got torpedoes, etc., etc. Then taking in and quickly retrofitting it with additional torpedo banks or more AA, etc., that doesn't fundamentally change the nature of the ship or its balance of firepower. It just means it has slightly more of it. So maybe it starts off from a better position of being slightly better better armed and obviously designed to cope with that weight, whereas other ships will become better armed, but obviously potentially start having stability issues, have to start removing things. The single biggest problem comes with your hull form, because your hull form, if you're designing a ship to be overweight, has to support that additional weight. So if you're designing a ship that's actually supposed to be 12,000 tonnes standard, but you're pretending it's 10,000 tonnes, then you've, and you're actually making it 10,000 tonnes, then you've got a hull that's just, that's going to, you know, support 12,000 tonnes at a designed waterline. Well, if it's 2,000 tonnes lighter, it's going to sit suspiciously high in the water all the time. And people are going to notice that unless, I don't know, you stash a couple of thousand tonnes of lead in the pole or something like that. And if you do that, people are going to very rapidly... Again, look at your ship, work out the dimensions, work out the weight of what they can see and what should be down there and go, mm, this is riding very, very low for a ship that it has this hull size and is supposed to weigh, uh, displace only 10,000 tonnes. And although it's not definitively confirmed or proven, at least until I can dig into some very obscure archive and maybe find some direct information on it, but this is actually... One of the reasons why I personally suspect, as I've mentioned a few times before, that the county class kind of pulled this off. I I deeply suspect they were designed for but not with armour. I do know some people disagree with me. But, as I have mentioned in previous videos, the ease with which they coped with having, well, for a lot of them, having their box armour protection extended into full belt armour protection in terms of both the speed of it being carried out, HBIS London's rebuild aside, and the way they then carried themselves and handled themselves at sea during the war with all the various upgrades they, that they had chucked at them. You stick that much weight of extra steel on a ship that wasn't designed to have it, it should have a lot more problems than the counties historically did. And as this picture of HMS Norfolk shows, and you know, feel free to have a look yourselves, in an awful awful lot of photos of county class cruisers pre-world war ii and especially pre the some of the modernization programs in the mid to late 1930s where they had this additional bell timer installed an awful lot of the county class like this seem to be riding just a little bit high now riding just a little bit high such that your anti-fouling paint is exposed in peacetime is not uncommon you can find photos of everything from destroyers to battleships and carriers doing it. But the sheer prevalence of this is something that I find suspicious. Um, it's very difficult, actually, to find a pre-upgrade, pre-World War II county class photo where they're not sitting high, and in some cases not sitting suspiciously high. And then once they have these refits with additional armor and once you get into world war ii obviously they're adding radar more aa and everything instead of sitting quite deep in the water which is what you'd expect for a ship that's had loads of extra weapons and protection jammed onto it they seem to generally sit at roughly the waterline almost as if they were designed that way but let's say that's my personal little theory at the moment dm phoenix asks with regards to anti-torpedo nets what exactly was the follow-up procedure once a torpedo was netted by a ship? Was a section of the net to be cut loose with the torpedo? Was the entire boom detached? Or did they send some poor old seaman to crawl across the boom to physically dislodge a presumably live torpedo with a stick? Well, fortunately for the odd seaman who might otherwise have been given a rather precarious duty, Anti-torpedo nets were not like fishing nets. So here's an example. They're actually pretty darn heavy and pretty strong. I mean, they have to be considering they're, you know, they need to stop a, the equivalent of a 
heavily loaded van crashing at 40 miles an hour. They are, in fact, made up of steel or iron hoops. So it's a large metal mesh net, in some ways almost like a gigantic version of male armour from the medieval period. And they they catch torpedoes, quote-unquote, in as much as the torpedo hits them, and they stop the torpedo getting to the battleship, or whatever ship is deploying the nets. But the nets weren't designed to just catch and hold a torpedo inert. They have, as you might guess from the amount of metal being used, a fair amount of mass in and of themselves. So the idea was that a torpedo, when it hit them, would actually detonate. So you wouldn't need to go fishing about for bits of torpedo. Um, if anything, you might need to bring the net in to maybe repair or replace a few links. Um, but ideally, the torpedo should actually blow up upon hitting the net. And then, because it is far enough away from the ship, because it's from the boom, um, then the explosion won't affect the ship too much. In practice, it depended on exactly how strong the net was, how flexible it was, how far away you deployed it, etc. You know, in some cases, when a torpedo hit torpedo net, it exploded, but the shockwave still did some damage to the ship, but not as much as a direct hit would have caused. In some cases, the torpedo nets were too light, and the torpedo kind of punched into them, carrying the part of the net with it. it. Still exploded before hitting the ship, but exploded much close, too close for comfort. And in some cases, it worked perfectly fine. The torpedo hits the net, explodes, and the distance is far enough that the ship feels the explosion but does isn't damaged by it. Um, very occasionally, obviously, a torpedo might actually be caught and held by a net, but that would be a very rare event, especially considering that most torpedoes would either sink when they ran out of fuel or depending on what kind of torpedo you're looking at would also possibly detonate when it ran out of fuel so if you did catch a torpedo and it didn't go off instantly there was a good chance that when the engine ran out then it might blow up anyway or as i said if it just went inert it might either just pop to the surface or sink um, it would be an incredibly unlikely and event and something that they wouldn't really be very prepared for if they had to go fishing inert dead torpedoes out of a torpedo net, which is probably fortunate for all concerned. Paige Jackson asks, what do you think of Admiral Spruance's performance as the commander of the Fifth Fleet? I think he did a pretty good job, all told. As I've said before with Spruance, um, my evaluation of him, and certainly one that seems to be shared by a number of his contemporaries and historians thereafter, is that, yeah, he wasn't all flash and aggro like Halsey was, or um, and, you know, he was very much his own command style, but Spruance had a laser-like focus on the actual mission, and the actual mission wasn't always charge off and kill as many Japanese as humanly possible, uh, for example, in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, his mission was to keep the landing safe. He kept the landing safe. Um, you know, he, he got the Battle of the Philippine Sea won. Yes, it wasn't a complete smashing of the Japanese fleet, but it smashed the important bits, the carrier air arm. Yeah, sure, some of the aircraft carriers survived, but really all they were good for after that was decoys. So, you know, mission accomplished, really, at that point. And likewise, when it came to his management of battles, he looked, what is the objective in terms of what am I here to do? Am I here to destroy the enemy completely? Am I here to secure this landing? Am I here to take this objective? Am I here to disrupt this enemy trade link or whatever? And he focused on that. And he did that. And then he concluded, right, mission accomplished. No need to risk any further lives. Let's go back and continue on with the mission we're supposed to be doing. So, yeah, apart from Philippines, it doesn't lead to the kind of glorious smashing victories that other admirals aimed for. But it, 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 his command style is in large part responsible for the inexorable steamroller that the United States Navy and the other armed forces became as they marched their way across the Western Pacific, because it would have been very easy, and indeed a lot of Japanese tactics relied on luring the Americans into some kind of grand confrontation, one-on-one -on -one or whatever, where they could uh, take them on and destroy, even if it cost the Japanese a good chunk of their own fleet, at least destroy a significant portion of the US fleet so that they felt unsafe about continuing their advance. Um, 
but that did didn't happen under Spruance's watch. So I think he did a, a, a pretty creditable job. You know, the if you're going to come up with an analogy for it, having someone like Halsey in charge of the fleet is, if you want to put it back in terms of older warfare, is the equivalent of a column of French troops coming in in the Napoleonic Wars, you know, the classic Napoleonic column. Trumpets blazing, so trumpets sounding, drums blaring, people chanting and singing, uh, massive intimidating force. And yeah, it's going to come on and when it gets close enough, it's going to charge and it's probably going to break you and continue breaking you and sweep you away. But you can see it coming and there are things that you can do to deal with it because you've given the time to notice it. Whereas Spruance's method of command reminds me a lot more of some of the accounts of certain British units certainly in the Peninsular War and in some other ones where you'd have no you'd have no singing no chanting nothing like that just dead silence the marching of boots and maybe a, a snare drum to keep time just calmly methodically and silently walking towards you no rush and then at point blank range, the the entire gun battery available to that regiment levels and fires. And then the killing begins. That that seems to be a lot more of Spruance's style. Um, and I kind of like it. Texas and La Choc asks, in the early 20th century, what, which did nations take greater pride in? The race to build the most powerful battleship or the most opulent ocean liner? I think it depends on on the time period in the interwar period when you've got things like the queen mary and the normandy being built i think people generally are taking more pride in their ocean liners now in part that's because for a good chunk of that the various naval treaties mean there aren't any new battleships being built uh, and even once the treaty battleships start being built most of them pretty much aren't in service until immediately before or during world war ii actually starting so, yeah, 1920s and 30s, I think it's most nations are taking much more pride in their ocean liners because, well, they're the only big ships that they're building, uh, apart from carriers. But carriers don't really attract the same kind of notice as a as a big ocean liner does. If you wind back the clock to pre-World War One, so 1900 to 1914, then I think it does it does depend a fair bit on exactly which nation you're looking at because for someone like say um, the UK the primary pride at that point is going to be in the Royal Navy the fact that other things are being built that are very large like ocean liners um, yes Britain as a nation would take pride in something like the the Lusitania or the Olympic and obviously the Titanic, etc. But that would be seen, as far as I can tell, at least from what I've read, as more of a example of the natural extension of the naval supremacy of Britain as opposed to the naval supremacy deriving from the greater sort of commerce and mercantile wealth although you know the ties between the two are very cyclical whereas perhaps for an upcoming nation like germany although they do take pride in the high seas fleet the launch of things like the imperator or the uh um vaterland etc probably there's a lot more pride taken in those in germany relative to its navy than it is in than it's taken in uk ocean liners in the pre-1914 period and likewise as you go further down the line uh, basically i think the 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 less that your nation's um pride rests on its position in the naval hierarchy the more you feel free to take more pride in your ocean liner traditions and and capabilities and and vice versa Robert Sokal asks, it seems that revolutions have much more impact on the Navy than on ground forces. Consider the French, Russian, Soviet and Chinese revolutions. In all three cases, the ensuing, ensuing civil wars on land were, were won and new regimes more or less established themselves. However, France, Soviet Union and People's Republic of China were in naval decline for several decades. Why is that? 
What's so special in naval combat that depends so heavily on institutional memory? It's a twofold process that is kind of linked together. Firstly, as you mentioned, having a good navy relies on institutional memory to quite a, a large degree. Also, even aside from the long-term uh, memory of the service, the actual skill of commanding a battle fleet is down to the strength, in a lot of cases, of the commanding officer, the admiral or commodore. And to get to that kind of position, you need years, at, well, actually, more accurately, you need decades of experience. You know, you're not going to have admirals in their early 30s, except in extremely trying and unusual circumstances. And so if you disrupt that chain of experience and build up, and especially if you get rid of your existing crop of admirals, then you are going to have a problem because not only do they pass on their knowledge to their successors, which is why you have multiple tiers of admirals amongst other things, uh, but also if you don't have good admirals, you're much more likely to suffer significantly higher casualties in battle. And if you do that, then a lot more of your best and brightest or potential best and brightest are going to be killed off before they can get to high rank anyway. Um, and this kind of ties into one of the issues with particularly the three revolutions you, you raised, but also with some other revolutions, which is that to be able to organize, lead, command, and supply a large fleet of any description, whether that be 20 ships, 30 ships, or 400 ships, it requires a certain level of intelligence, which is usually, or well, not always, coupled with a fairly high level of education. And with the French, Russian, and Soviet revolution, uh, French, Russian, Soviet, and Chinese revolutions, quite often it was people who were educated or people who were well off, because remember, for a lot of the time, it was only the well off usually who could afford education or the aristocracy. Um, those two sometimes did go hand in hand. And those were exactly the kind of people who, on land, were the targets of the revolution. So n they ended up being disproportionately removed, either from command or from life. And that meant that all the knowledge that they'd built up was gone. So you then had a navy without any real leadership. The leadership they did have was usually untried, usually over-promoted too quickly... And if they started showing signs of thinking and acting in a way similar to the previous admirals, you know, like getting a decent working knowledge of what was going on, um, then that could be dangerous because they might think for themselves and not for the glory of the revolution, comrade. So off to the gulag or the re-education camps or the guillotine they went. And so you wipe out this massive body of institutional knowledge within the Navy, you stop it from being replaced... And you are also teaching the people who are coming further up the ranks from below that the best way of keeping your head is to not think too freely, not think too uh, proactively, just follow orders and be nice, a uh, nice, good, unimaginative comrade and you'll be fine. And yeah, you will be right up until a slightly more imaginative, slightly more free thinking opponent shows up and turns you into scrap metal. And it usually takes a while, usually for the, the firebrands and such like that are pushing the, the current revolution to either feed on themselves or just die off um, before people start acknowledging that maybe just maybe you do need the odd uh, sort of intellectually advanced person commanding the massive logistical war machine that is a major navy in order for it to be successful. Brian Roper asks, Generally speaking, when a ship would be designated as a flagship, how many additional crew were required for an Admiral's shipboard staff, and what roles would they play in fleet operations and day-to-day -day flag operations? It's almost impossible to put a specific number of them uh, onto any particular Admiral or time period. So taking Admiral Lee as an example, he made good for a significant portion of his time in command with a single person on his staff, and for a good time after that, his staff was still less than half a dozen. But then at later portions of World War II, 
he had a staff that was well into the double digits and these numbers varied up and down somewhat and the same you can can be said for most other admirals now occasionally you'd have an admiral who was famous for bringing almost an entire destroyer's worth of crew with him as staff and sometimes you'd have an admiral who would show up with two or three people and that was all the staff you ever needed so you know it's almost how long is a piece of string question but if if you're looking for a ballpark figure you're probably looking at something like eight to a dozen um for the average admiral shipboard staff if we're not talking about someone who's in command of like half of your country's entire fleet or something like that and in terms of what role they play in fleet operations and day-to-day -day flag operations well again it depends on the size of the staff some if at the absolute minimum the staff might just be fielding collating and composing and running messages for the admiral so the admiral might be doing most of the t tactical thinking that he's decided he has to do and his staff is literally just sitting there making sure that everybody knows what he's what the admiral wants and making sure the admiral knows what everyone else wants or is telling him as that staff grows you might well have additional men brought on board who can help the Admiral with tactical planning and who may be going out gathering intelligence from other ships or for even possibly on the ground and coming back or wargaming things out, talking talking with other staff on the flagship from the more regular crew, um, maybe even coming up with plans and writing reports themselves for the Admiral's approval if they're being relatively autonomous about it. You might have certain members of the staff who are dealing specifically with certain portions of the fleet. So in a World War One or World War Two context, you might have the Admiral, his staff, and obviously all the, the secretaries and that kind of thing. But then you might have an officer or two who's dealing specifically with amphibious forces and another officer who's dealing that same World War Two with the surface forces, another officer who's dealing with anti-submarine and patrol duties another officer who's dealing mainly liaising with the aircraft carriers and so on and so forth and all over the place and logistics is also a very important part of things so you might have officers in the admiral staff who are keeping track of how all the various ships are doing logistics wise now have you got enough fuel have you got enough ammunition where are the supply ships can we get them here on time are they loaded with the right kind of ammunition and fuel and supplies if there's an urgent requirement for something do we need to get it here and how quickly how can we get it here quickly and so forth and so on because let's face it if in the grand scheme of things if you are let's say you're fighting the pacific war and someone back in the continental united states receives a message you know from commander i don't know uss baltimore really need an additional eight inch gun elevator mechanism because uh, one of the forward turret left hand gun is jamming a little bit would be appreciated asap thanks if that kind of thing crosses your desk you're like yeah go in the pile with about a billion and other billion one other captain requests or you know destroyer division seven commander says um we've expended all our mark 15 torpedoes in action uh, we need some more because we only have enough back at our our forward staging post to re-equip half of my ships okay that might be a bit more serious you know when's the next transport out okay just make sure that there's a bunch of uh, extra mark 15 stuck on there when's it gonna get there? i don't know three weeks whatever uh he'll get them when he gets them whereas if from the desk of admiral lee or from the desk of admiral spruance or from the desk of admiral halsey i want torpedoes and i want a gun elevation mechanism and i want them yesterday that might generate a little bit more in the way of um shall we say enthusiasm amongst staff officers uh in the rear echelons to get things moving ferrata victrix asks when a warship is being designed at what stage do systems like plumbing and electrics for the crew get considered do the designers have to work the plumbing around the armor bulkheads etc or can they get holes through them to allow pipes or cables through now whilst things do vary and change a little bit during all of this time when you know armor is a part of a ship structure generally speaking plumbing electrical equipment that kind of thing is brought in fairly early just after in terms of priority the main armor components but 
whilst mostly subordinate to them, they do have a little bit of a say. So it's not kind of, we've designed the entire ship, every single bulkhead, every single hatchway, every single deck, all the hull plating, armour protection systems, etc. Right now you have to try and wire this thing up. And no, you can't touch anything. But it's also not, let's have the electrical and plumbing layout and we'll try and work the ship around it. So in a very crude overall section um, of things, what you're looking at is they'll come up with a basic hull form, the frames of the ship, where they're going to put the main bulkheads, the main armour belt, armour deck, barbettes, etc. And then you will consider, right, well, the ship has to be, assuming it is being wired up, I'd say you're talking 1870s forward. If we've got to put the wiring and the plumbing in at this point, now where are we going to lay all of this around those main things? Because you can't have your main armour plate, whether that be your belt armour or the armoured bulkheads that are either end of your citadel or whatever. You can't have those pierced by a billion and one electrical cables and pipes and such occasionally this would happen occasionally you know either be in the design process or even after afterwards when the ship was being refitted people would put cables and pipes through major bulkheads and su such like and it usually didn't end very well because then when uh, something horrible happened to the ship it turned out that you know the rest of the bulkhead you know it might be a couple of hundred square foot of of solid steel that might have held up just fine, but where you put a, a one-foot pipe through it, well, the pipe wasn't armoured, so the pipe fails and then water pours through anyway and the ship sinks and it's all very horrible. Um, it's one of the ma many laun of the laundry list of items that were found after Pearl Harbour when the ship's damage control capabilities were examined, for instance. Um, so, yeah, you don't want that happening. So if you're going to have say a plumbing system well it's either going to have to exist outside the the citadel inside the citadel or if it's going to be integrated it's going to have to be integrated above or below the citadel armor it can't go through it um, and similarly for the electrical systems i mean obviously you want redundant electrical systems anyway but you don't want to run electricity cables through things like your primary water type bulkheads if you can at all avoid it uh, and that can lead to some rather interesting spaghetti snake like um wiring and plumbing layouts on ships where you want to have whole systems connected together but it's better to have that than introduce major design flaws that could sink your ship outright and that's the end for this week's dry dock thank you very much for watching this is the last regular dry dock that you'll be hearing before i head out to the states you will get your regular infusion of dry dock while i'm there however uh, which is good to know for some of you at least and the last remaining dry dock before I head out will obviously be the Patreon one next week and the accompanying live stream. So with all that said, thank you very much and see you again in another video.